presentation for us this morning and has travelled all the way from the USA to be able to do that for us. Um, so Keith is a um, senior scientist and lecturer at the um, University of Santa Barbara, California um, and is a, a prolific publisher. So um, Keith has a list of publications that are incredibly long. So and if you put Professor Keith Clark into Google, up pops his um, biography so you can find out all about him. So, Uh, 
itself behave exactly the way something does in the real world, um, if its results mimic uh, the performance of the function. So we don't necessarily have to build a miniature model uh, of the system to be able to understand the system as long as the results are effective. Um, we recreate structures, of course, and these usually forms, and I'm a geographer, so when the forms are usually spatial, my point of view, my answer is often that. I recognize that most people's answer is not always that. Uh, it can be many other things. Um, you should be able to use a model to create uh, and do forecasts, and forecasting is often uh, takes the form of an experiment. And we're not really interested in perhaps the most likely future outcome. We want to you know, tweak the, the parameters. We want to push the system to its limits, see, perhaps learn about when the system breaks down its critical uh, tolerances and thresholds are. And models, of course, propagate their errors. Data have errors uh, in them. And when we calibrate models, we try and eliminate the errors from the systems themselves, or at least understand the error from the system. Um, we often fail, in my, my point of view, to validate the models effectively, make sure that they are working, and provide systems with controlling distribution of error. So we have to recognize that the modeling sequence is a sequence and we propagate errors that begin with the data uh, through the sequence. What we should really need to do is to look at the sensitivity of the model, go to the final result, look at the degree of confidence that we have in that uh, final outcome. From my point of view, I use stochastic modeling and uh, Monte Carlo simulation, but there are many other techniques that can be used for introducing beginning to understand uncertainty within the modeling uh, systems. So I've been working on urban growth. I started on urban growth and extended my model to incorporate uh, land use change. And these are obviously very important uh, characteristics of the landscape. Urbanization, uh, you might argue, is one of the defining features of the problems that uh, we inflict upon the environment. And land use change, of course, is fundamental change to local property values. So it's, a, it's an important thing to know and understand. The data uh, on this are maps and statistics of the various uh, land use mapping efforts that have gone around, about, around the world recently have been uh, very encouraging. Uh, they're probably uh, massively inadequate uh, on a global scale, but we do a pretty good job sometimes on a, on a regional and local scale. I've spent the last uh, three months looking at European land use land cover data is really quite very good. Uh, to calibrate our models, so to understand the future, we look to the past, so we often need historical data. And the nature of historical data is such that the uncertainties increase as we go backwards in time because we didn't realize that we used uh, inadequate methods uh, to do mapping in early time periods. So we don't even have, say, aerial photographic records that go back much beyond. 20s or so. So as we go back in time, we find new sources of inaccuracy and error within our data. And there's this critical need in modeling for consistency, especially if we want to understand change, because what we would like is absolutely consistent definitions that are invariant over time while things are changing around them, so that we can actually compare apples and apples instead of what we often do, which is apples and oranges. And consistency has at least these three limits, so these three um, elements. Uh, the first one is the need for consistency in time. And this geographic spatial reference frame in which we locate objects it is not consistent. It's, uh, we use different data, we uh, use different coordinate systems, we collect data in different ways, we scan photographs, we use remote sensing. The reference frame of our data is, is continuously changing, and resolving the differences as frames change is, is very complex. There's inconsistency in time. In, in the ideal possible cartographer's ideal world, we receive billions of dollars every five years or every three years or whatever to go out and remap the world again on exactly the same principles. But of course, it doesn't work that way. We get it back in 1954, another one in 1962. 
these uneven samples of time, and we would like to make um, conclusions about change with these rather, rather poorly drawn temporal samples. And then, of course, we have inconsistencies in the theme. I've worked for many years on land use mapping, and I've seen many land use mapping projects begin, and I always hear the same thing at the start of the project. Let's make a few changes to the land use classification scheme because we can make it better. And every time I hear that, I sort of cringe uh, because it doesn't really matter what the scheme is. Uh, the important thing is that it not change over time so we can actually uh, learn something about how changes are taking place in the environment. Um, of course, not only changes uh, over time uh, in individual locations, but as you go place to place, uh, the codes change considerably. The largest project I've done recently involved with adjacent communities in a single county in California. And every single one of those adjacent communities, six, had its own schema for classifying residential uh, and uh, commercial industrial land uses and its own classification system. And none of them managed, of course. If we can do these things, if we can get consistent data, then we can do some simulation. We can use modeling to do simulation. Um, simulation has enormous advantages. Uh, as we just heard earlier, we only have one Earth, and um, it's often said that we're conducting the ultimate experiment on the Earth by increasing the CO2 content in the atmosphere. Uh, but we don't have a backup. Uh, but we do sort of have a backup when we do computer simulation on because we can play games with the computer, but we can never um, uh, accomplish the same results by doing analog experiments with the real object. And the computer does provide us with immense amounts of resources for doing this uh, simulation. So I'm going to choose a particular type of model uh, and uh, look at it in a little bit more detail. Please uh, bear some of these principles in mind. Uh, and I want to talk first about cellular automata because the model that I've worked on for many years now is a cellular automata based model. And a CA is a system in which is defined very, very simply. So its inherent attraction is simplicity in this case. But I'll come back to that point later on. Cellular automata consists of a reference frame, which is usually a set of cells. The cells are often squares, but they don't have to be. And the complete set is often rectangular, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, within the cells, or each cell, can have a set of states. The states have to be exhausted. The cells are in a state, and there should be uh, at least two states, but there can be as many states as you like uh, as part of the system. We need a set of behavior rules. Uh, behavior rules uh, deter, apply locally to each cell. We can apply the rules to the cell. And the rules are about state transitions. That's, that's all they're allowed to do. And they can be very simple. You can say, under these circumstances, a cell that is white will become black. These circumstances, a cell that will black will become white. It's a uh, minimal scale. Then we need time to pass, and uh, there's a lot of debate within uh, the uh, theoretical literature about how you do uh, update within cellular atomic systems. Uh, from my perspective, we use only synchronous update. In other words, the whole grid operates at the same time. Time passes one step at a time as we move all the way forwards. Uh, within, within cellular automata, the cells are autonomous. This is a very important uh, property. The behavior is localized, and the cell really only sees its neighbors and doesn't see the whole world, and it doesn't have the big picture. But uh, interestingly enough, very complex things can emerge as a consequence of this uh, simplistic behavior. So here are a few examples of, of cellular automata. Uh, these are from a uh, rather famous cellular automata called The Game of Life. And uh, I, I can't resist this because Douglas Adams was a Santa Barbara resident at uh, the time of his death. It's put regularly in use as many great guy. Um, the Game of Life itself is part of my, my computer uh, simulations operational matrix, uh, just as we heard in the, in the, in the movie. So the, the uh, properties here, what we're seeing are simple CA. We're seeing initial conditions, sets uh, of uh, patterns, and then we're allowing time to iterate. And 
we're seeing some of the, the characteristic phenomena that happen when you when you engage, in this case, only three uh, behavior roles on the, on the game of life. Uh, we see some patterns that become stable, uh, remain stable for periods, and then disappear like the square on the left-hand side. Uh, we see some features that maintain stability only by movement, like the uh, center uh, object. Now that's called a glider, and uh, gliders are And then we can also have division and recursion in the right hand screen is the uh, what are called gliding guns, complex sequences that behave for a while and suddenly start shooting out their objects the way, say, a cell divides um, in uh, biology. So, so, so Sleuth, my model is a, a cellular automaton model, and it works like this. It sets up the environment of the city using GIS, you bring in a series of data layers that's necessary for its input. As a series of grid images, and you convert them into a fairly common graphic uh, image format. Um, the important data are the data about the history that uh, look at the change of the system over time. And the goal of the calibration process is to go to the earliest time period for which we have data and to start with those initial conditions and train a cellular automaton to make it behave the same way that the actual city uh, behaved in as it. Uh, so we use the um, city's history as an initial condition. We run the cellular automaton forward in time, and then since we do have data at some time periods right up to the present, every time the model reaches a place where we actually have data, we can stop and compare the way the model is behaving with the way the world actually behaved. And then uh, my goal is to test this, because CA are very easy to, to compute, is to do this many, many times figure out which sequence, which behavior rules, which conditions generate in the simulation run, which best simulates reality. But rather simple uh, modeling approach. But of course, in reality, it's a little bit more complex than that. Sleuth is not one, but it's actually two cellular automaton models, uh, one of which generates the urban growth, uh, and the other one generates the land use change. So we, uh, uh, we link the two together with so called tight couple, because they're part of the same together synchronously of the image time period. The amount of land use change is a direct function of the amount of urban growth. And I felt this was a reasonable assumption. I've tested it a few times and it seems to work well. So when urban growth is slow, land use stabilizes. When urban growth is rapid, land use destabilizes and uh, needs to change more. Either part of the model can be used independently, so if you just want to
place in the landscape, we test uh, that place against a series of coefficients that represent things like topographical slope, uh, and we allow uh, growth to take place. Perhaps if the criteria are correct, we test a pixel. We decide that it's going to become purple. Um, this is controlled by a parameter, a coefficient. If the parameter is set to zero, then there is no diffusion within the system. Growth only takes place adjacent to existing growth. Uh, if the coefficient is set to 100, then growth can take place pretty much at random anywhere uh, within the, the system. Here's another pixel. But of course, cities don't behave like uh, random diffusion. They have an aggregation effect. So if, you, if you throw 100 gas stations out across the landscape, um, one of them might become the next Tyson's Corner. Tyson's Corner proof of a single gas station at a road intersection outside of Washington um, in the mid-1950s. It's now a community of uh, it's, it's approaching 200,000 people. So some settlements are going to grow and others are not going to grow. We need to, we need to build into the model favoritism towards having certain centers grow. And uh, the way I do that is I pick certain settlements that are just urbanized, like that one. I look at its uh, neighborhood and apply some random constraints to, to the immediate neighborhood. And if it meets those constraints, then the adjacent pixels are also urbanized, sufficient that the cellular automaton behavior will now make growth uh, appear in that, uh, in that location. Case we set up a new center. Most cities spread also organically. In fact, cities normally spread at their edges. If you want to find the place most likely to urbanize around a center, just go to the edge, drive your stake in the ground. That's where it's probably going to urbanize next. Um, so this is the uh, phenomenon which leads cities to spread, to sprawl. Um, it also leads to infill, so unfilled areas within the urban area. By this kind of growth. And this is straightforward and simple. We just look at pixels that are adjacent to pixels that are currently in the world. So it's a neighborhood effect of CA. We look at those, and if they pass certain criteria, then we allow those to have a as well. The last behavior type uh, burns the transportation system into the uh, model's behavior because transportation systems do influence um, urban growth through quite substantial. Actually, after years of working with this model, I think that was the most predictable uh, characteristic was that if you build a road, you will build houses on the road. And I, I've never been able to persuade anybody to give me money to do this, but I would love to go out in the middle of the Nevada desert and build about a mile of six-lane highway with nothing else there, and then come back ten years later and see whether or not I'm sitting there around the um, but of course, the, the effect of transportation uh, is to attract development towards it and to move it along the road. So the model does precisely this. It looks at a newly urbanized center. It then looks around that point to see whether or not there is a road. If it finds a road, it's allowed to move the settlement to the road and go off on a random walk along the road uh, until it finds a location. When it locates on the road, it then urbanizes enough of its neighbors that that is now going also become the new spreading center. That's it. That's the open growth part of the cellular tunnel. It's no more complicated than that. It can actually be written in about five lines of uh, computer code. Okay. Then, of course, we do land use change, and um, it's a little harder to explain the uh, land use change part of the model, um, but it is based on uh, the transition matrix. The, uh, we take two land use uh, images compute the difference matrix, look at the combinations of uh, likelihoods of change within the classes, and then I draw random numbers against that table. Um, but that doesn't allow for pers persistence, spatial persistence, and spatial autocorrelation. So the way to build that into the model, uh, I, I've found, is to track a new cellular automaton that exists not in the geographic space, but in the change space. That's the delta triangle part of it. Um, so if we make a series of behaviors that happen in change space and then impose those changes onto the environment periodically, we get this effect of perpetuating 
change, because change, land use change has a little bit of memory persistence. Pixel goes from, say, forest to agriculture. It's probably not going to turn back to forest again in the next time. And those rules are just simply applied in sequence, one after the other, uh, for all of the time periods that you want to do a simulation. There's no more, more complex than that. From the point of view of getting data together for a model, it, uh, this is how I came up the end with the name. Um, I just put the names of the input layers together into a, you know, that acronym, uh, generator uh, that I found on the internet, and chose Sleuth as the, as the name. So it uses topographic slope, and that's obviously very important. In fact, it's a critical slope at which no more construction takes place at a, at a critical slope that can be input by the, by the user. And what I found as, as I applied the model all over the world is that that, that number is sometimes written legally. Uh, in some places it's legal, but it, there are a lot of variations from it. It's within my community in Santa Barbara. Uh, it's actually a 25% slope. Uh, but I see development taking place on everything up to 40% all over the place. We have a lot of uh, problems with landslides in California. Um, but it, community by community, you know, I've, I've seen 30-story power plants built in Hong Kong on 50% slopes. Um, so again, it's, a, it's almost culturally determined how that maximum slope power is going to be. We need at least two land cover layers that we can use for comparison. The excluded layer is the uh, the uh, weighting that we place to exclude things like the lakes and uh, rivers and the ocean that are not going to change. And we can also weight the excluded layer to include things like zoning or preference uh, for growth in particular areas. We need urban layers, which are the history of the growth of the urban system. We need as many as possible transportation layers because the model is responsive to transportation. We need hill shading because I need an H. <laughs> um, the method of calibration is what we call brute force calibration. This means that we use the computing power to do uh, and explore the parameter space by doing an enormous number of, of computations and uh, testing each one of them. The five parameter combinations give us one to the fifth possible permutations. I'll skip over some of these, uh, get to some running out of time here. Some of the outputs that the model is able to produce, it'll do probabil probabilistic images of um, the future. It'll allow scenario-based exploration, and it will produce models of, uh, of uncertainty that can then be used or brought back into GIS to, to be used for testing. Uh, as I said, we've now got over 100 different applications of the model on every continent except for Antarctica. Unfortunately, there's not much urbanization there. Um, there are, there's an application to Sydney already, and now we're having uh, Melbourne applications in the GIS, as we've uh, seen. It's been applied across different scales, and I've recently published a book chapter reviewing developments in the model over the last 10 years. Um, Sleuth is able to do scenario testing because there are things that you can manipulate. You can change the urban pattern in the future, so if you know that you're going to build something 10 or 15 years from now, you can do that and see its impact. You can change the transportation network. You can change the zoning or the, the exclusion layers. Uh, you can fill with the parameters what we call crossbreeding, make one city behave like another city. Uh, and then, of course, you can couple the system with, with other models to do more complex modeling. Here's some of the scenario based work that we've done where we've produced models of uh, urban growth with and without the boundary constraints uh, that uh, restrict development. Um, a student of mine, uh, Jack Monstead, has been working on California counties and the, uh, determining the effect of, of a piece of legislation we have called the Williamson Act, which is a, a restriction on, uh, on development that's made between farm owners and farm property owners and counties that uh, basically give tax breaks if you, if you agree not to develop your land for at least 10 years. And we've been able to, this is Tulare County, to look at the impacts of different scenarios with and without enforcing the Williamson Act. We've been able to actually map the Williamson Act parcels and look at the, uh, the impact that the Act is having on the way that change is taking place. So here we develop uh, an exclusion layer with information about the 
react and we're able to do scenario based uh, testing as a consequence. Uh, I did want to mention the, uh, the work on Melbourne here. The UPI Parkville uh, is, is using Sleuth as part of a complex uh, pattern or an amalgam of models uh, to do uh, like have a forecasting. Uh, the particular application, thank you, Claudia, here, that's, is in uh, West, Western Fort Catchment. Melbourne, and uh, here's at least an animation of, of one of the scenarios uh, taking place following its development. One of the more interesting things that uh, they've been doing here that I was, I was delighted to see is this, taking the output from Sleuth and then posting it directly into Google Earth, because uh, Google Earth has the ability to work with just with it, and also allows uh, uh, broad dissemination distribution of the forecast so that you can begin this process of uh, the public feedback on the model results. Um, I'll leave. I'll leave.